Number 1. Christy Lynn Vorak Christy Vorak was just 13 years old when she was seen for the last time on Halloween night in 1982. The teen had been living with a foster family in Tacoma, Washington at the time. She did not have a history as a runaway or a record of any crimes, but she did frequent the streets of Tacoma and neighboring areas. She may have been sighted later in the evening at a bus depot in Seattle, Washington, but this report has not been confirmed. Her mother believes she may be alive and well, but authorities are of the unfortunate opinion that she is deceased. In May of 1993, Christie's name was added to a list of probable victims of the notorious Green River Killer due to her Pacific Northwest location, where many young women disappeared and or were murdered by the suspected assailant between 1982 and 1984. The killer, later identified as Gary Ridgway, was convicted of 48 separate murders and later confessed to double that number. Vorak is one of seven women suspected to be among the unconfirmed victims of the Green River Killer. Ridgway pleaded guilty to those 48 counts of murder in November 2003. He agreed to cooperate with authorities in exchange for them dropping the death penalty specifications against him. Ridgway is serving life in prison without a possibility of parole. Christie remains missing to this day and foul play is suspected in her disappearance. Two, Veronica Linhart Safransky. On October 26, 1996, 40 year old Veronica Safransky attended a costume party with a friend at Mix Bar and Grill in Warren, Minnesota. Safransky was separated from her husband at the time and was decked out in an elaborate Pocahontas costume. At approximately 12.30 a.m., her friend at the party was unable to locate her inside the establishment and witnesses later reported that she was seen leaving with a man named Kevin Sekjervin, a sex offender with multiple charges against him. The couple reportedly departed from the restaurant in his black 1997 Dodge Power Wagon pickup truck with Oregon license plates. Safransky has never been heard from again. She was reported missing later that day. A few weeks later, a belt, believed to be part of her costume, was found along a country road half a mile south of the crossing of Marshall County Roads 8 and 6. However, an extensive search of the area yielded no further clues of any kind. When police questioned Sekjervin, he admitted to leaving the party with Veronica, but claims to have no knowledge of what happened to her afterwards. Sekjervin has never been charged in connection with her disappearance. He was released from prison on unrelated charges in 2002. Even as the months turned into years, Safransky's parents continued to search the remote areas of Marshall County, hoping to find some answers as to what happened to their daughter. Her case remains unsolved. Three, Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley. Pamela, 15 years old, was last seen in Oscoda, Michigan on October 31st, 1969, the day of their high school's homecoming football game. She and another student, Patricia Spencer, 16, had planned to attend a school homecoming football match and then attend a Halloween party later on. The girls had decided to skip a class that day to prepare for the game that night. The two girls knew each other but were not friends. Later that day, Pamela's boyfriend informed her parents that she had not arrived at the party. Both families soon learned that the girls had not attended the party and that they were both missing. The parents informed the police and eventually, the case became a missing persons investigation. At first, authorities thought they had run away, possibly to the Flint, Michigan area, but they reconsidered this theory after weeks passed without contact. Pamela's sister never believed she'd run away. She stated Pamela was happy with her life and had recently gotten engaged to her boyfriend. For decades, it was reported that the two girls were last seen walking down River Road, away from the school. However, recently it was found that a passing motorist had given the girls a ride to a gas station at River Road and Interstate 23 on that same day. 
The motorist claimed he had been questioned extensively at the time, but for some reason the news reports kept insisting they were last seen walking away from the school. Investigators suspected that the girls continued hitchhiking after they were dropped off at the gas station and were abducted by, quote, two or more assailants, and eventually murdered, although very few leads were ever uncovered. Patricia and Pamela weren't carrying their purses or identification along with them at the time of their disappearances. Over the years, many theories have been put forward, one being that the girls were buried under a barn belonging to a man named Jack Serrell. Decades later, the local chief of police directed a search of this property with the aid of cadaver dogs, but nothing was ever found. Jack Serrell, the owner of the barn, is now deceased. His property had a reputation as a popular party spot for teenagers in 1969. It is unknown whether the rumors pertaining to the barn also implicated Mr. Cyril as a suspect. Both girls remain missing to this day, and foul play is suspected in their disappearance. Emmanuel Manny Dominguez on October 31st, 2013, Manny attended a Halloween party at a warehouse near Damon and Walnut in the West Town neighborhood, Chicago. At the party, he ran into his ex-girlfriend and then left with her and her associates by car for Bucktown. Along the way, Manny reportedly got out of the vehicle and left. This was the last time anyone saw Manny alive. When the family members couldn't reach Manny after several phone calls, he was reported missing. His car was found abandoned a few days later, but there was no clues inside or around the vehicle to aid the investigation. His cell phone had last pinged at the intersection of Division and Halstead. Then, a week later, Manny's body was found in the 2700 block of Maryland Street in Gary. A police officer patrolling the area about 11.20 am saw a burnt out vehicle and when he stopped to examine it, found legs sticking out of the trunk. The coroner determined that Manny had died from multiple stab wounds. His ex-girlfriend was questioned. However, no arrests or major leads have been distinguished. There's a $10,000 reward for anyone coming forward with the information leading to the arrest of the killer. Number 5. Chris Jenkins On Halloween night in 2002, Chris Jenkins and some friends visited a keg party before heading to a place called the Lone Tree Bar and Grill to celebrate the festivities. The group arrived at approximately 10.30 pm and around an hour and a half later, Jenkins was removed from the establishment by security and banned from returning. This left Chris literally out in the cold. And since his Native American Halloween costume had no pockets, he had asked his girlfriend to keep his wallet, keys and cell phone in her purse for him, and his coat was left inside the bar. He was last seen heading north from the bar. No one is sure exactly what happened to Chris after that. When Chris did not return home, family and friends immediately became worried and notified the police. The police believed that Chris may have attempted to walk home across the Hannapin Avenue bridge, then went off on his own somewhere else. But Chris was very responsible. He was not known to stay away from his apartment without calling anyone. As days passed with very little progress in the case, Chris's parents decided to hire a private investigator. The investigator looked at the footage from two surveillance cameras in the Federal Reserve Bank which pointed to the Hennepin Avenue bridge. Crossing the bridge would have been Chris's quickest route home. However, Chris was not seen on the tape. Later, witnesses told the investigator that on the same night a large group of men attacked a lone person, possibly as a gang initiation just across the street from the bar where Chris was last seen, though it is not confirmed if this was Chris. Two different scent tracking dogs on separate days picked up Chris's scent on the sidewalk in front of the pizza joint. 
then followed the scent into the parking garage next door. Blood drops and a red feather, possibly from Chris's Native American costume, were later found inside the garage, but the trail came to a halt in that spot. Four months later, Chris's body was found on the east side of the Mississippi River, a victim of what police believed to be either a suicide or an accidental drowning. However, his family knew this wasn't the case and got their own experts involved. They learned that the appearance of Chris's body did not fit with the suicide or accident theories held by the police. Due to the natural reaction trying to swim, most drowning victims are found face down, arms out towards their sides, clothing disheveled, and one or both of their shoes missing. Chris was found on his back with his arms crossed in front, his shirt was still tucked into his drawstring pants. This led to the speculation that Chris was already dead when he was placed in the river. He also had human hair clenched in his left hand, which was later found to be his own hair. GHB, a date rape drug, was also found in his system. He was still wearing both oversized slip-on shoes, a necklace and a ring on each hand. Based on these new findings, the case was reopened in 2006 and his cause of death was changed from accidental drowning to homicide. While the authorities have withheld specific details, they claimed that an incarcerated suspect told them that he was present when Chris was murdered and thrown off a bridge into the river. But there was skepticism about his story, since Chris had no broken bones or injuries and it would have been impossible to toss him over the bridge's high safety railing without his body hitting a steel support beam and vertical metal cables on the way down. Nor did anyone report it seeing anything unusual on the bridge that night, making the claim all the more unlikely. In July 2007, Hennepin County declined to press any charges against the inmate, citing lack of evidence. One possible theory is that Chris could have been the victim in the mysterious smiley face murders. During this time period, approximately 40 male college students in the United States were victims in a bizarre series of drowning deaths. In many of these cases, unexplained smiley face graffiti was found near the body of water where the victim drowned. This led some to theorize these deaths are connected and that the victims were drugged before being thrown into a body of water to make their murder look like an accidental drowning. But unlike many other smiley face murders, no smiley face graffiti was ever found in relation to Chris's death. No one has been charged in his murder and his case remains unsolved. Thank you.